how thankful we are that you have revealed yourself to us. Lord, we're thankful that you have given us your word. And Lord, we pray that you would now come and by means of your spirit open our eyes to behold the wonders, the glories that are here. Lord, help each one who is listening to focus and rejoice in the truths of this passage of Scripture. And likewise, Lord, I pray for myself that you would help me to be a herald of these truths. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, today is Sanctity of Life Sunday. So, just a couple days ago, January 22nd, was the 48th anniversary of the Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision that legalized abortion in our land. And I want us to think about this issue this morning. Abortion is not first a political issue. It's a moral issue. And as Christians, we have a moral imperative to stand up and speak up for the lives of the unborn. As a nation, we seem to refuse the personhood of those who are in the womb. We deny the existence of unborn humans. That is, unless they're wanted. If we, if we want them, well, then it's, it's our baby. But if it's unwanted, well, then this is just some clump of tissue. We all know that that's not true. That's just a, a suppressing of the truth. It's holding back what is obvious. We all know that the inhabitant of the mother's womb is a person. It's a human baby. And the Bible's crystal clear on this. So I want to invite you to turn to Psalm 139. This is a psalm in which David is praying to God and he's praising God for God's particular involvement, his special role in creating and forming every child in a womb. We'll see in this passage three reasons why we should protect human life even in the womb. So again, Psalm 139. I'll begin reading at verse 13. This is the word of the Lord. God's holy, perfect, inerrant, and infallible word. David prays, You formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. This is the word of the Lord. Reason number one why we should protect human life in the womb is that children are made by God. Children are made by God in the womb. Look again at verse 13. David prays, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. David understands that his creation is the very work of God. It's God who personally fashions every baby in the womb. People speak of making a baby, and the only one who makes a baby is God. God knit you together. He personally fashioned you. Like a weaver creates a tapestry. Even more than God creating our physical body, here the text says that He created our inmost being. Now this is controversial among some, but we are more than physical, right? We're not just biology and chemistry. We're certainly more than animals. We have an inner self, a soul and a spirit that too was made by God. We see this in the earliest sections of Scripture. In Genesis 1, verse 27, God writes this, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. 
There in the first chapter of Scripture, we have such a profound statement that among all the other things that God has made, mankind is made unique. You made made in God's image. So we are persons created to be like God, to, to show off something of who God is. We are little representations of God. We're not God, but we are made like Him. We're made in His image. We have personality and intellect. We have creativity. We have speech. We have a moral nature. God not only created our physical bodies, but God created the inner person, your innermost being. And where does God do this work? If you will, what is God's uh, workhouse? His art studio, you might say. Where does he do this incredible work of creating people? Well, the scripture tells us it's in the mother's womb. So look again at these rich words. Verse 13, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Now when you get down to verse 15, it's really just a restatement of verse 13, but with more poetic language. Look at verse 15. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. So the reference to secret and the depths of the earth, that's just a poetic way, a figurative way of describing the womb. God is working within a mother. This is astounding. Look at... Verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. And then the beginning of verse 16, your eyes saw my unformed substance. So there in the womb, God is both working and he, he sees, he, he has this ability to know everything that's going on in the womb. He, he has perfect sight. But what is it that he sees, especially there in verse 16? This is interesting. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. Again, people try to refer to the inhabitant of the womb as a blob of tissue. Well, here we've got an unformed substance. But notice that David's referring to it as his unformed substance. You see, the Bible's clear on this. There's already a person there. Even before it's, it's shaped into what we would say, okay, that looks like a baby. From the point of conception, there is a human being, a person, there in the womb. And God is doing an incredible work within that womb. From every point beyond conception, there is a tiny person in that womb. Now today with ultrasounds, we get to see some of what God has been able to see all along. That there's a tiny little human, a little person there within that womb. So just 18 days after conception, that's two and a half weeks, a heartbeat can be, be heard, can be measured. At six weeks, the baby's brain waves can be measured. At eight weeks, the stomach, the liver, the kidney are all functioning. And his or her little fingerprints have already formed. You see, God sees every child in the womb. And God is personally fasting, fashioning and shaping every baby in the womb. God designed the womb to be the special place of nurture and protection. That seems intuitive, and yet we need to think carefully about this. God has designed the womb as this, this shelter, this safe place. In fact, the, the word that's used here in verse 15... My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret. This word secret is used a few other places. Let me show you some examples. So Psalm 91 verse 1. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. In the King James that reads, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. So there's this secret place, this shelter, this place of protection that in our passage is referring to a womb. We see the same word in Psalm 32, verse 7, where the psalmist prays, You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with the shouts of deliverance. How incredible that God designed a place within a woman's body that He uses to protect and grow another human being. I mean, this is truly amazing. 
Right? When we just stop for a moment, this is astounding. The primary purpose of the womb is to provide this shelter, this hiding place for the developing child. Now, there are many dangerous places for children, but statistically speaking, in the United States, the most dangerous place for a child is within a mother's womb. That should not be. That is a great evil in our land. To willingly make the womb a place of death is iniquity, transgression, that's sin. Let's focus on what it is that God creates within that womb. Specifically, who it is that God creates. God's workmanship, his masterpiece, his work of art, are little humans made in his image. Look at verse 14 again. David prays, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. So again, this is a psalm of praise. He's saying, God, it's amazing what you've done. And look what he says here. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. So let's start with that word fearfully. I'm fearfully made. This doesn't mean that we are made scary. This is the word that's used to describe the fear of the Lord. It's referring to a reverence, a godly fear. So we treat God with reverence and respect. And likewise, human life should be treated with wonder, with reverence, with seriousness. Here is a person who's been created in the image of God. We should marvel at God's incredible creation in the womb, and we should certainly respect it and protect it. David also says, I am wonderfully made. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Now this word for wonderful refers to being distinct or set apart, distinguished, one of a kind. Here it means that every human being is uniquely created by God. So this isn't just some assembly line. This is God hand-making each one of us. And every one of us is different. Sure, we have lots of similarities, and yet we are distinct people. And God has made us that way. David finishes the verse by saying, wonderful are your works. Here he uses a different word for wonderful. This is wonderful in the sense of something that is extraordinary. This is what God's works are like. They're masterpieces. They're works of art. God is personally shaping and painting and working out all the details of each person there in the womb. He's skillfully weaving together the various part of every child to make this beautiful product that is a person. Each one of us is uniquely and beautifully made by God, the master craftsman. This is actually really encouraging. This is, it, it lifts your soul to think of what God is doing. When we take all of this together, it means that you are a special creation of God. You have been created in God's image. You have been made unique and extraordinary. Human life is indeed sacred, and so we should treat it with dignity and respect and reverence. Think with me for a moment of you know, all of the care and protection that you know a, uh, an art museum would give to taking care of a crystal vase or a, a priceless painting or some other work of art. The temperature is controlled, there's security, make sure people can't get too close. There's all these things to protect that piece of art. How much more so... Should we provide care and protection for little babies made in the image of God? We should indeed protect all human life, even those yet unborn. Because children are fearfully and wonderfully made by God in His image. Secondly, the second reason why we should protect human life is because children belong to God. Children belong to God even in the womb. So look again at verse 14. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. 
the works are the Lord's works. They, they belong to Him. He's the creator, therefore He's the, the owner of all that He has made. We see this theme again and again throughout the Scripture. We sang of it this morning. Psalm 100 says this, verse 3, Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. So because He's the maker, we belong to Him. We are the Lord's. So God as the Creator has the rights of ownership over all that He has created. As our maker, He's the possessor, the owner of what He has made. Before we moved to Brookville, my wife and I had the, the privilege of being foster parents. We uh, had several small babies in our home. Each one we got, we, Leslie would go to the hospital and, and, and get the baby directly from the hospital, and they'd come into our home for a time. The very first one that came, sweet little girl, she'd only uh, a few weeks, I think she's three weeks old, come get her from the hospital, bring her back, and she just became part of the family. We, we just loved her and cared for her, and, and the kids were all there. Everyone just, just all, all in on loving this little child. Well, the mother had moved to a different county. And so the judge ruled that the baby should move to a foster family in that same county. So I received a phone call just a few weeks after she'd come to our home saying, we were going to come get the baby in an hour. <laughs> and, and, you know, we, we knew what we were signing up for. I mean, we, we know, you know. And yet, uh, there was something truly devastating. Here was this little child that now was, now was going. And I remember taking the car seat and giving it to the worker who's going to drive away. And giving that little baby a little kiss. And as she drove away, or she was in the car that was being driven away, I, I was crying. I mean, it, it was a weird experience. I was coming to reality, coming, coming to realize the truth I already knew, that this baby's not mine. She doesn't belong to me. She was just entrusted into my care for a time, and, and we got to care and love her and, and then send her on her way. But as she was driving away, it hit me that that's not just true of that foster baby. That's true of my biological children, the ones I would call mine. They belong to God. They've simply been entrusted to my hands for a time. You see, every baby, every child, every person belongs to God. So from a biblical perspective, abortion is not about a woman's rights. No, you see, no mother owns even the child in her own womb. No parent owns their own child. All children belong to God. So he's the giver of life, and therefore only God has the authority to take life. Let me just be abundantly clear. Abortion is the taking of a human life. It's murder. It's evil. It's wrong. In America, it's genocide. I can make this point from lots of pieces of scripture, but I've chosen Genesis 9, verse 6. It says this, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. You see, the fact that people are made in God's image and belong to him means that we don't have the right to take a human life. God says, you shall not murder. It's clear. Children belong to God, therefore we must protect their lives. Third reason why we should protect human life in the womb is this. Children are planned by God, even in the womb. Children are planned by God. Now, you may have a pregnancy that you didn't plan, but it was planned by God. In fact, God planned out the whole life of that little child. Look at verse 16. The second part of the verse says this. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. One more time. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. So God has, has written down, he's planned out the number of your days before they come to pass. You see, God has planned out the life of every person. God has a plan and a person uh, and a purpose for each child's life, even before they're born. 
Joe Wheeler has written about a doctor who had the experience of uh, delivering many babies. I want to read you some of his experience. He tells of a particular time when he was delivering a baby that was in the breech position. This was dangerous for the baby because the head comes out last. The doctor has to be careful to quickly deliver the head so that the baby can survive. When the first foot appeared, the doctor reached up to grab the other one, but he could not draw the two down together. Soon he realized what was wrong. The entire thigh from the hip down to the knee was missing. At this point, the doctor pauses. He recalls, I knew what a dreadful effect this would have upon this unstable mother. The family would almost certainly impoverish themselves, taking the child to every specialist in the world. I saw this little girl sitting by, sitting sadly by herself while other girls danced and played and ran. I could slow my hand. I could delay for just a few moments. No one in this world would ever know. And the mother, after the first shock of grief, she would be glad that she had lost a child so sadly handicapped. The little pink foot bobbed out against and pressed firmly against my slowly moving hand. The hand into whose keeping the safe keeping of this mother and baby had been entrusted. I couldn't do it. I delivered the baby with her pitiful little leg. Every foreboding came true. Her mother and the baby, or the mother and the baby were hospitalized for several months. Years went on, and I blamed myself bitterly for not having the strength to yield to my temptation. The doctor goes on to tell how years later, he was at a Christmas party at the hospital. He continues, there, three lovely young musicians were on stage. They played softly in unison. I was especially fascinated by the young harpist. She played extraordinarily well, as if she loved it. Her slender fingers just flickered across the strings. Her face was turned upward, as if in that moment the world was a wonderful and a holy place. When the short program was over, there came running down the aisle a woman I did not know. Oh, you saw her, she cried. You must have recognized your baby. That was my daughter who played the harp, the little girl who was born with only one good leg 17 years ago. We tried everything at first, but now she has a whole artificial leg on that side. And best of all, through all those years, she, used, she learned to use her hands so wonderfully well. She's going to be one of the world's greatest harpists. She's my whole life. And now she's so happy. Here she is. The sweet young girl had quietly approached. Her eyes were glowing. Impulsively, I took the child in my arms. And I relived those awful moments when her life was in my hand. And finally, I found the comfort I had waited for so long. See, what that doctor finally learned that day was that God has a plan for every baby, every life in the womb. He thought perhaps it would be better to just end this life. But the truth was, he didn't have the right to do that. And how foolish it would have been. Life is to be preserved. No one had the right to take away your life as a child. Neither do we have the right to take another person's life. No one has the right to interfere with God's plan for a child in the womb. There's no way around it. Abortion's wrong. It's murder. So we should protect human life for these three reasons. Because God made every child. Because children belong to God. And because children are planned by God. Now I want you to think with me for a moment. What does this mean for you personally? This text means that you were fearfully and wonderfully made by God. You were made in His image. You are, in a real sense, extraordinary. You belong to God. You were planned for by God. And yet, you have rebelled against God. You see, we are all accountable to our Maker, to our owner, to our God. We have sinned against God. We have sinned against others. We've even sinned against our own children. Hear me this morning. Whatever your sin, God is willing to forgive you. He 
offers you cleansing and healing because of Jesus. You see, God sent His Son who lived the perfect life. He did everything right. He obeyed every command. And then He chose to die a wretched death. He chose to die the death that sinners deserve in their place as a substitute. More than that, He rose victoriously from the dead, showing that He had paid the full price. So that if you turn from your sin and you trust in Jesus, if you repent and believe, you can be forgiven. The worst of sinners, even those who would murder their own children, can be forgiven because of what Jesus has accomplished. I plead with you, if you have not put your hope, your trust in Jesus, don't rise from your seat without doing so. Today is the day of salvation. Trust in the one who died in the place of sinners. The purpose of this message is not to condemn the mistakes of the past, of which we all have many, but it's to affirm the sanctity and the value of human life. What a gift given by God himself. So as I close, I want to draw your attention to three particular ways where we can speak up to protect the lives of those who are unborn. First, you can pray. You can pray for mothers and unexpected or crisis pregnancies. You can pray for authorities. You can pray for the Supreme Court of our land, for politicians, for everyone who has a role that would address this particular issue, that their hearts would be changed. You can pray for those in the abortion industry, those who work in these clinics, these places of death, these slaughterhouses, that they would see the evil of what they're doing and turn and repent. You can pray for our country as a whole, that we would see this evil and not stand for it any longer. Secondly, you can vote. You can vote for people and policies that protect the lives of those who are unborn. Thirdly, you can give. You can give financial or volunteer support to local crisis pregnancy centers. We have two, one in Clary, one in Punxsutawney, that are worthy of our support. In fact, we're taking a special offering this month. Any gift that's marked with the word life is going to go directly to supporting those ministries. I encourage you to give towards this valuable work. They're providing assistance to mothers in need. Let me conclude with the words of Proverbs 31. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. So let's pray. Lord, what a wonder it is that we are fearfully and wonderfully made in your image by your hands. Lord, we thank you for the gift of life. And Lord, we ask that you would use us to preserve life. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.